Hello everyone and welcome to this course on modern application development. Now let's look at this concept of HTTPS, right? the so-called secure version of HTTP. In order to understand what HTTPS is and why it is required, let's first understand what happens in the normal HTTP process. Right? The client opens a connection to the server on a fixed network port, typically port 80. It transmits an HTTP request, which we already know what it looks like, right? It's a get slash HTTP slash 1.1 or 1.0 or whatever the version of it. And maybe some additional headers. But all of those are things which anybody can read. I mean, they're essentially English language headers. It also gets back HTTP response, which once again has a bunch of headers, which are in English and some body text, which is whatever needs to be sent back. Now the problem over here is, let's say that I have a server and a client. They are connected, well, by some kind of link. I keep saying the wire, but in practice it could be multiple things. You might have a Wi-Fi connection to your router. From the router it has, uh, let's say, an Ethernet connection to the nearest switch. From the switch to the local exchange, it could be a fiber optic con uh, connection. Then, you know, uh, then there are like multiple fiber links that it goes through and finally it reaches the server. All of that put together is abstracted out into one wire. Okay, And I could potentially think of someone sitting out here who is an attacker. right? When I say an attacker, it's not someone coming to beat you up, but it's someone who is trying to get information about you that you don't want them to have. So the attacker is basically sitting over here and has somehow managed to tap into the wire. Right? So what could this be? It could be your Wi-Fi access point. Right? Maybe you are in a coffee shop somewhere, Starbucks or uh, Barista or whatever it is, and you know you have turned on your Wi-Fi and you are connecting to the local Wi-Fi access point without authentication. Okay? Or it could be uh, the physical Ethernet. Right? They manage to go in there and tap a couple of wires that are actually present physically. Or it could be the fiber optic itself. Right? They manage to go and actually split the fiber optic cable, put in a splitter right? and collect the data that's going on it. Right? So you don't really get to see that there, you don't understand that there is a break in the cable because they are still passing the information through. But they also have a splitter that allows them to see what information is going on the cable. So all these things are possible, right? And I want to make sure that the information that I sent to the server cannot be read and understood by the attacker. That's the best that I can say. I can't prevent them from actually, you know, seeing the ones and zeros on the line. But as long as those ones and zeros don't make any sense to them, I'm probably safe. So what it means, in other words, is that this wire, I need to encrypt it. Encrypt meaning I need to use some kind of a mathematical function which will convert it into a different set of bits which I understand, the server understands, but nobody else can make any sense of. And one other thing that could potentially be done is it's not just about getting the information. If they actually have a tap over there, they could potentially even alter the information, right? So they could take a GET request from you and change it into, let's say, a post request that changes your email ID or something of that sort. Okay? Because after all, they could also just split this somewhere and take the link to themselves in order to change the information that's being sent out. Okay? So all of that is possible, which means that there has to be some way by which I can guarantee that the wire cannot be tapped or altered. Now, for that, essentially, there is this concept of the secure sockets layer. The secure socket layer essentially sets up an encrypted channel between the client and the server. Okay. How do we do it? I need to have some kind of a shared secret between the client and the server. right? So typically this is some kind of a long binary string, some big number. This is the so-called encryption key. Okay. And once I have such a string, I can basically take whatever data I am planning to send and just you know, use the XOR function or some kind of mathematical function to combine 
my key with the data to be transmitted. Okay, at the simplest form, that's all that you really, really need to do. Okay, and the point is because this long binary string was unknown to the attacker, right? They can't invert it and get back the original information that was being sent. Okay, so the attacker without the key cannot derive the actual data, and that's all that I really care about. It also means that if they don't have the key and they try splitting the line and you know pretending to be me that also won't work because they need that key in order to create the new request to be sent to the server otherwise the server will say the key was invalid i don't understand what request you are trying to send over here and reject it okay so it all comes down to how do you set up a shared secret okay you must assume that anything that you are talking to the server can be tapped in other words it's like you know you are sitting on one end of a room the server uh, is somebody who's sitting on the other end of the room and you're trying to talk to each other and you need to establish some kind of code words between yourself but everybody else in the room can also listen to you okay so how do you do this you can't really do it easily unless there was some other piece of information right that both of you trust and can be used in order to set up this kind of shared secret okay Effectively, it is creating something called a side channel. Right? I can sort of say that, okay, look, uh, if my partner at the other end, you know, also knows some other third person or you know knows something about them, then I can take some mathematical functions related to some common information that both of us have, right? Create a key which is related to something that only I have. Send it across to the other person in a way that they can understand and anybody else who is listening can also understand but then they combine it with another secret of their own and send it back to me so finally a secret that i have and a secret that the server has has been combined in such a way that nobody else who is listening to this conversation will be able to find out the actual nature of the final okay how exactly this is done is way beyond the scope of what we can do in this course you know it's a fascinating topic and you know uh, anybody who's interested should really spend some time reading about it but for the time being let's just assume it can be done and one way that you can think about it is you know which you are familiar with could even be that maybe i send a one time password on sms that might be one way by which i can share a piece of information between the two obviously the one time passwords are only like a few digits long so by themselves they are not long enough to be used as encryption keys but they can be used to derive an encryption So, you know, like I said, there are a few different forms of security. One is the channel level security, that is the wire itself, right? And you want to ensure that no one can tap the channel. Now, in the process of doing this, I also need to be able to trust that the server that the other end that I'm talking to is the correct server, right? It can't be just someone who says, okay, you know, I'm the email server, connect to me and, you know, give me your username and password and I'll show you all your emails. I need to be fairly sure that the server at the other end is the correct server before I give the username and password. So server authentication is important. And similarly, another form that is used is sometimes we use something called a client certificate. Right? This is rare, but is actually a very good form of authentication. Makes it in some ways it's even better than using password because it's you know you can't sort of distribute the client certificate easily. You can't like just lose it. Right. So if you have a client certificate, then the server can rely on the client certificate and say, yes, I know that you are the right person and here you can have this information, it's meant for you. Okay. So how does this sort of, you know, trusting that I'm actually talking to Google happen? We have this notion of a common root of trust. Okay. And what I mean by that is, I personally don't know who runs the gmail server okay so how do i sort of trust that i am actually talking to the gmail server well how do you actually trust a person that you are meeting now for the first time right let's say you have a common friend who is able to introduce both of you right in that case you can clearly say that okay you know i trust this friend you also trust this friend so fine i'll trust you okay or at least i trust that you are who you say you are because this friend knows both of us and is you know, introducing us. 
in the same way there is this notion of certificates right so for example in the browser bar if you when you type in the mail or google.com you will see this padlock icon right this basically indicates the secure link right which basically says https and you know you might find that different browsers show this in different colors to indicate that yes it is secure or it is actually like some kind of validation secure some extra validation and so on right but the bottom line is what it's saying is you have mail.google.com they have a certificate which in turn was issued by gtsca which is basically the google trust store certificate authority which in turn goes to the google trust store root authority so there is one certificate which has been created by the Google Trust route, which has been given to the Google Trust Certificate Authority, which in turn has been given to mail.google.com. Okay. It has a lot of information associated with it. It says when it will expire and it also says the certificate is valid because you know clearly the expiry date is after the present date. It also talks about who has issued the certificate. Right? It says it was issued by Google Trust Services. Okay. So finally comes the question, who is this Google Trust Services and why do I trust them? Okay, because I don't know anyone at Google. Right? The point is you are using a browser, you install the browser from somewhere right? and inside the browser it automatically has information saying trust Google Trust Services. Okay. And in fact your operating system itself Windows, Mac, Linux, whatever it is, will have some kind of set of certificates that it's built to trust. Okay, And you can put in a new trust certificate over there and say, okay, you know, trust all of the things that are signed by this root entity. Okay. Now, what that means is that when I download a browser, I am implicitly trusting all the entries that are there inside that browser. So if for some reason somehow somebody managed to manipulate the browser and get a fake root entry into it, I am in trouble because I would now start trusting things issued by that fake root. Okay? This is a very complicated uh, you know, problem to solve and in general at some point you just have to sort of buckle down and say okay fine you know I trust that what I got over here was okay or at least the operating system that came installed with my laptop was done properly to start with. If that itself had been hacked by someone and modified, there's not much I can do. Okay? And that's literally the truth. But at this point, what it's saying is because your browser now trusts Google Trust Services, therefore everything else which is signed by Google Trust Services is also trusted by you. And you know that therefore this is actually mail.google.com. So there is this concept of a chain of trust. Mail.google.com was issued a certificate by GTS. Certificate Authority, which in turn will issue the certificate by GTS root. And that would be stored either in the operating system or the browser. Right? And like I said, do you trust your operating system? Do you trust your browser? There has to be something that you say, okay, fine, you know, this is the bare minimum. I will trust this and from there build everything on top of that. There are potential problems. So, for example, this GTS root might not be known to older browsers because Google Trust Services itself was set up a few years back right and older browsers when i say old i'm talking about really old more than 10 15 years old might not even have been updated with new chains of trust okay now the worst case scenario is if someone steals a certificate at the root of trust which means that somebody setting up a root of trust actually has to have like very very serious security setup to ensure that such a thing cannot happen right if it is stolen, it can cause all kinds of problems because now they can start issuing certificates that are essentially fake and will be trusted by all the browsers that trust this root of trust. Now, what about the domain name? Right? Because after all, mail.google.com, I am going to that website based on some DNS lookup. If I end up having a broken DNS system or somebody manages to modify my DNS setting, I might end up going to a different server. But the good thing is that the certificate that is already stored in my operating system or in my browser will eventually fail. And it will say something's wrong, right? I'm trying to connect to this server. It looks like the Gmail server. It says it's the Gmail server. That's what the DNS lookup says. 
but the certificate is wrong and it will pretty much you know at that point bomb out and say you can't connect okay this is usually rare because these kind of hacks are very difficult to do but they are possible at least in theory now there is also a notion of something called a wild card certificate for example iitm uses that there is a certificate that has been issued for star.iitm.ac.in so anything www.iitm.ac.in ee.iitm.ac.in uh, academic.iitm.ac.in, all of them can use the same certificate, right? And in this case, it is issued by another root of trust. It's not UDA, right? It's not Google Trust. It's by something else, a company called Sectigo, which in turn has its authorization from another company called User Trust, right? So the entire chain is available, visible over here for anyone who wants to verify it. Right? It also gives the details of the subject name and also the issuer, issuer name. Okay, so what's the impact of using HTTPS? It, of course, has positives. The main positive being that now the link between you and the server is secure against wiretapping, right? Meaning that even if you're on a public Wi-Fi network, uh, let's say in a coffee shop or somewhere else, as long as the server to which you are connecting uses HTTPS, you can be reasonably sure that anybody else who's listening in on your conversation will not be able to get uh, important information uh, related to this particular link, right? So at least on public Wi-Fi networks, you need to make sure that you are actually connecting on HTTPS. Now, nothing comes for free. HTTPS can have a little bit of a negative impact, especially in terms of the performance, right? Meaning that you are performing runtime encryption. And the other negative impact is on caching, right? And what I mean by caching is, a proxy server that sits between you and the between the client and the server could have cached some of the common files let's say you know certain images or javascript files or other things but when you're using an https connection the information about your request doesn't get seen by any proxies you can't use a proxy right the proxy can just act as a pass through and send the information through to the server without being able to see what's inside the request because all that is encrypted okay which means that a proxy cannot respond to any requests that you have. Right? So caching also becomes a bit of a problem. It's a bit of a trade-off as usual. And finally, the benefits from security are considered worthwhile. 